Whenever there's a murder, it's the job of detectives to find out who the killer is and how they killed. And often, it's forensic evidence which provides the clues. Each bit of information delivers that to the whole jigsaw. I was able to test that sample uh, and I got a DNA profile. There's no doubt at all that forensics were absolutely crucial in this case. In this series, we shine a light on how cutting-edge forensic techniques and the power of science were able to bring some of our most dangerous and despicable killers to justice. This was such an unnatural crime. It's not a question of if he will kill again, it's a question of when. He believed that he was invincible and, and that nothing could stop him. We'll hear how some of the toughest and most disturbing crimes were solved thanks to the tiniest fragments of evidence. When you begin a forensic investigation, you don't know what you're going to find. The officer plunged his hand into loose soil and actually felt cold flesh. From the type of insects that were around, uh, she'd been dead for at least five years. And how even the most forensically aware of killers couldn't beat the experts and hide their crimes. You know, if he comes out, heaven help somebody. Because he is a dangerous, dangerous man. In this episode, a gruesome discovery in a shallow grave. Clearly it wasn't any accidental death. I mean, she was the victim of a murder. But before police could catch the killer, they'd need to identify the victim. Normally with most crimes, you, you want to investigate what has happened. Well, we couldn't even begin to investigate what had happened in this case, really, because first of all, we needed to know who this person was. Could a unique form of forensic science unlock the mystery? You put a skull in the front of the newspaper and say, does anybody recognize this person? And you'll get diddly. Put a, a reconstruction there and somebody will re react to it. This is Forensics Catching the Killer. This is Norby Road, Fairwater Police Station, which at the time was the divisional headquarters. I think the first thing I thought of was this could become my second home for the next few months, uh, because I quickly got an idea of just how big the investigation was with the number of officers and staff that had been mobilized and the number of police vehicles that were around. It just felt absolutely huge. And you know, the biggest investigation I'd worked on up until that time. In December 1989, DS Jeff Norman was part of a hundred-strong team of detectives from South Wales Police, drafted in to solve a brutal murder. You felt that bit more pressure, and you knew the, uh, the whole team was going to be in the spotlight. Um, so it was going to attract an awful lot of public interest. So you were just determined to try and make sure that you got the best possible result. It's an investigation that would turn out to be far from routine. In the shadow of the Principality Stadium, and next to the River Taff, is Fitzhamon Embankment, once one of the city's most desirable addresses. By the late 1980s, many of its large Victorian terraced houses had been converted into flats and bedsits. It was a disturbing discovery in the rear garden of one home that would launch one of Wales's biggest murder inquiries. Journalist Martin Shipton covered the discovery of the bones for the city's main newspaper. There were some workmen who were in a, uh, a garden and they were digging up the ground and um, buried not very far below the surface. In fact, I believe it was 22 inches. They came across the body, or rather the skeleton, of somebody who clearly was unidentified. So... This was um, a major story at the time, and obviously that was a pretty horrendous thing for anyone to find. It wasn't unusual in those days for us to get calls about bones being discovered in gardens when people are digging them up, and more often than not, they turned out to be animal bones. Uh, but this one looked a little bit different, with the flax 
it just didn't look right. It was an extreme challenge for the police uh, to identify the victim of this murder because while there were a few items of clothing, um, clearly uh, one couldn't identify who it was from the face because the face was no longer in existence, it was a skull. Um, there, there was a skeleton. Um, the, 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 the details were extremely sketchy. But of course, there was a drive and determination that not only did we need to identify this person, uh, we also needed to find out uh, how she'd come to that awful end. Uh, there was a real determination to find out exactly what had happened. So we immediately called in the Forensic Science Service uh, and the pathologist. With only bones, fragments of clothing and the carpet the body was wrapped in as evidence, could forensics tell detectives who this unknown person was and how long they'd been buried for. The Home Office pathologist was the first one to start uh, putting us on the road with the information that we, were, we, we needed to identify what it was we were dealing with. What usually happens is that the pathologist will go along to the scene and have a look at what is there and see whether there are any injuries or anything like that. Um, present that he can identify, he or she can identify, but also to look at what type of skeleton it is, to see how tall the, the skeleton is, how tall the person was, what sex the person is, the gender, uh, to a great extent, the ethnicity. They will have a lot of important information that they can get in the skeleton by looking at the size of the bones. The forensic pathologist's report helped determine the bones belonged to a girl aged between 14 and 17. But the skeleton wasn't the only thing that could reveal vital information about the age of the girl and when she might have been buried. The other items of interest that were uh, of great use to us were items of clothing that had remained. Obviously some of the synthetic bits and pieces uh, had not broken down, as had uh, the rest of the material. We had uh, buttons, we had a zip, uh, we had uh, clothing labels, all of which would give us some information that we could use, uh, importantly, to try and start building up a timeline. We could identify from that, we hoped, when they were manufactured, and we could start homing in on a, a date or dates between uh, that body might have been buried in the ground. Inquiries into her clothing revealed that the items hadn't been produced for at least five years. Officers now knew the sex and approximate age of the victim and potentially how long she'd been buried. And the pathologist also confirmed to detectives that she'd been forcibly restrained. What was also of great interest to us, as if it wasn't sus suspicious enough at that stage, was the fact that he uh, was able to reveal that uh, her arms had been tied behind her back. The forensic pathology report provided vital clues to assist the investigation. But detectives working the case now needed to establish who this unfortunate child was and why she'd been killed. December 1989, and murder detectives in Cardiff were on the hunt for a killer. A skeleton had been found wrapped in carpet and buried in a shallow grave close to the centre of the Welsh capital. But before they could find the offender, they desperately needed to identify the victim. From the forensic pathologist's report, investigators now knew she was a teenage girl aged between 14 and 17 but they still had no idea who this young girl, nicknamed Little Miss Nobody, was. People working on the team had children, and the overriding memory is that people were talking 
how come this person hasn't been missed? Why hasn't she been reported missing? Uh, there were no missing persons records uh, that we could find that could potentially link what we'd found in that rear garden um, to a missing person. It wasn't just detectives who were questioning how this could happen. When the body was found, uh, there was a lot of shock uh, in Cardiff because the location is one which will be known to very many people. It's very close to the city centre. It's just across the river from the big rugby stadium in the centre of the city. And um, people will know that area and will uh, not think that anything of this kind could possibly happen there. And I think there was a great deal of shock when it was discovered that the victim was as young as she was. So there was a steely determination to do what was right um, for her. Clearly at some stage there were people that should have been looking out for her, but hadn't. So, you know, that was our job. Determining how long the girl had been buried would help give detectives a time frame in which to search. Once again, could science provide the evidence of when she died? One of the most uh, important forensic breakthroughs we had was identifying um, an entomologist who was able to look um, at what was found within the bundle of carpet and also at the scene. What the entomologist was able to tell us and explain to us was that the way in which a body decomposes when it's in the ground uh, and that happens largely through the way that insects attack them and the different insects that do different things. The insect life was very helpful in, in explaining how long she had um, been in, in, a, in a situation where there weren't in, any insects around and then placed somewhere where they, where they were able to get to her. And I believe the entomologist also, or the insect man, shall we say, also was able to show that from the type of insects that were around, that uh, she'd been dead for at least five years and where insects had access to her. And he was also able to tell us that it would have been lain um, above ground after death and prior to burial, which again to us was uh, of great importance and it just heightens the, the suspicions that we had uh, that this was somebody who had met a violent death it meant police could now start to focus their inquiries on a specific time period. Starting with the residents of the flats on Fitzhamon Embankment. It was pretty obvious to us, given that the grave was some six feet from the rear basement flat door of the property, it was likely that the person living in that property at the time must have known something about what had gone on. So we knew who was living in the basement flat around the time that we were being pointed in by the scientists. Detectives next line of inquiry centered on the carpet that the girl's body had been wrapped in. A resident of the basement flat was able to tell us that she recognized that carpet uh, as it had been one that she'd selected uh, when the landlord asked her to when it needed recarpeting, um, and she thought that it might have been on, an offcut that had remained after the carpet had been fitted and kept in a, a cupboard under the stairs. So a lot of our research was done on those residents and the residents of the basement flat were of particular importance to us uh, and it was through some of those inquiries that we discovered not only the person that had lived there when the carpet had been laid, but also when Alan Charlton had lived there. But just who was Alan Charlton? So it's here in the centre of Cardiff in one of the, what is now pedestrian streets, Caroline Street, where Alan Charlton used to work as a bouncer at the XL Club, which was here. He was somebody who was quite muscular and obviously appealed to the uh, employers, uh, the people who ran the club, because they thought that he looked the sort of person who would be able to deal with any kind of trouble. And trouble would often find its way to this area of the capital. 
in part due to its location close to the city's main transport hub and a notorious hangout for ne'er-do-wells. Not far away was the bus station where uh, there was a, a cafe known, known as Asti's Cafe where um, one would see uh, young girls standing outside, uh, hovering around, and um, they were often runaways of one kind or another, people who were lost and Actually, they were pretty vulnerable people, but um, they formed part of an underclass in Cardiff, uh, almost a parallel society that um, Alan Charlton was also part of. And I suppose, in a sense, he straddled two elements because he was employed as a bouncer, so he was in gainful employment, but he also um, had an extremely unhealthy interest in young girls, which led him into uh, associating with these um, very unfortunate, vulnerable people. He was very much a ladies' man. Uh, he was known to throw lots of parties, including at, at the basement flat, uh, and that women attended uh, that flat, but also uh, some younger girls too. Investigators now had a person of interest. Meanwhile, another forensic discipline was helping detectives piece together how the young girl had died. As part of the identification process, we also used the services of an odontologist. He was able to look at the teeth, confirming the age range the pathologist had come up with. Another key finding of Dr. Whitaker's work was the blood that he found within the teeth themselves. But I believe that Professor Whitaker found what we call pink teeth, which is um, one of the signs that's said to be associated with strangulation. That may well be the case, but we have to remember that pink teeth can occur in all sorts of situations when somebody is in the process of dying, particularly if there is a loss of oxygen to the body. So it was clear to us that this person had met um, a violent death, uh, which fitted in with what we'd found from some of the other forensic sciences. Charlton's residence, just feet from where the body was found, had already put him on the investigator's radar. Now the forensic confirmation of the young girl's violent death tied in with the nightclub bouncer's previous run-ins with the law, raised suspicion further. Alan Charlton was of significant interest to us from that early stage because he was well known to other police forces. He appeared to be a violent offender and had been the suspect in rape investigations, uh, in assault investigations, where there was evidence uh, that women had been attacked. But those suspicions had not led to charges and Charlton denied any knowledge of the body found just feet away from where he used to live. Still without a name for the dead girl, the investigation needed a breakthrough. That would come courtesy of a relic dating back to 800 years BC. It all started with an Egyptian mummy, and that really was the start of my involvement with the, uh, with the forensic uh, fraternity. Murder squad detectives in Cardiff were frantically trying to identify the body of Little Miss Nobody, a teenage girl whose skeletal remains had been found buried in the garden of a flat close to the city centre in December 1989. They also had a prime suspect, nightclub bouncer Alan Charlton, but without knowing who the dead girl was and her possible connection to their suspect, police couldn't progress the case against him. Detectives now gambled on a new forensic technique to unravel the mystery of their victim. Crucial to the identification of this person was to try and put a face to that person. Um, and we decided that a cause of action that would assist us in doing just that might be to try and recreate from uh, the skull that we'd found what that person might have looked like. 
Now, in those days, I had no idea that something like that could be done. The man leading this pioneering process was Professor Richard Neve. I was employed by the University of Manchester, um, and I was working in the medical school as an artist, um, which involved at that time making drawings and paintings of various anatomical and surgical procedures. Um, also, it involved making uh, exhibitions and displays. The university had embarked upon a, a sort of interdepartmental project uh, to um, unwrap and study an ancient Egyptian mummy in the university's museum. And this uh, had a, n a number of spin-offs, and one of them was for me to take the remains of the skull um, and to uh, build a face. As part of the Manchester Mummy Project, Professor Neve was tasked with rebuilding the shattered skull of Mummy 1770 to create a model of how the Egyptian princess might have looked. I actually reconstructed the face of uh, this little mummy girl and uh, the resulting publicity <laughs> um, kind of went a long way. And that really was the start of my involvement with the, uh, with the forensic uh, fraternity, um, purely and simply because of the publicity that the mummy had generated. And it became uh, one of the few options that uh, a, a police force would have in trying to identify an otherwise unidentifiable body. Detectives from South Wales, including Jeff Norman, were soon heading to Manchester to utilise Professor Neve's unique skills. I took the skull to, to Manchester and I remember taking it in a cardboard box, it seemed very, very weird at the time, um, but clearly it was really important because this was something that could potentially lead to the identification of this person. He was confident that he would be able to come up with a, an image for us that might be able to jog somebody's memory. After making a cast of the skull, Professor Neve began to painstakingly rebuild Little Miss Nobody's face. I used the modeling clay and developed basically the underlying muscle structures of the face. So the muscles that form around the eye and the, the mouth and the muscles of the cheeks and building up all these muscles controlled to some extent by the measurements which have been placed into the skull. The face will grow from the surface of the skull out. It is not an artistic exercise at all. After around five days of meticulous modelling, Professor Neve had finally given Little Miss Nobody a face. What we're looking at here is a photograph of the reconstruction you can see she's got a fairly straight sort of forehead. Um, as with most females, the brow ridges are relatively light. And then she's got a fairly light sort of chin, very female sort of chin. It's a typical teenage face. The forensic facial reconstruction produced by Professor Neve was initially met with scepticism by investigators. I have to say it was very strange when we saw the image that he produced because the first thing I was thinking of, and I know after discussing it with colleagues, we thought the same thing. Does that look like a real person? Is that something that people are going to look at and say, I know who that is? There were limitations, but you put a skull in the front of the newspaper and say, does anybody recognize this person? And you'll get diddly, no matter how big the story. Put a, a reconstruction there and somebody will re react to it. And when the image was released to the media, detectives did get a reaction. 
We went to press uh, both locally and also went to Crime Watch um, to make an appeal. Uh, we had a lot of calls, um, but there were two calls of, of particular interest to us. Uh, one from a person who worked in a, a social services care home um, in Pontypridd, to the north of Cardiff, and they gave the same name as another person had phoned in with. Forty days into their murder investigation, police were finally able to give the girl known as Little Miss Nobody her real identity back. That name was Karen Price. Karen Price was quite a troubled young girl. At the time of what occurred, uh, she was uh, 15. She obviously had a troubled childhood because she was uh, living in an assessment centre at a place called Church Village, which is near Pontypridd, which is approximately 10 or 12 miles uh, to the north of Cardiff. And this is the children's home, or the entrance to the children's home. The walls, this is, yeah, this is the home that I spent two and a half years in. And obviously, this is the home that Karen lived. Or it was. Lee Hatch was a resident here, along with Karen Price, in 1981. 11 years of age, you're thinking, what? Where am I going? You know, my school isn't like this. My house isn't like this. This is new, it's different. There's good memories, but seeing the building itself brought back the bad memories as well. The first thing I thought about was the bedroom by there. Not the veranda that I jumped off. Not a gang of us in the doorway smoking. Karen would have been in this section here. This was then the television area. The other side of that was the games room. The dining area would have been them two windows. She always had something in her head, always. She was sort of banana rama esque way before they even thought about it. It was either a, a hat pulled down over her eyes or uh, some sort of bandana or a scarf or... And she always liked wearing men's shirts, which I found really strange. You know, it, she she wasn't a girly girl. Like many other kids in care at the centre, Karen often found herself at odds with staff. The solution, to abscond. I would say there was at least one a week. You know, it, it, it's... Um, and it might be that it wasn't proper absconding. You know, you'd have an argument with somebody, you'd run off, everybody'd start phoning around, they worried about you, and you'd walk back in. Three, four, five, maybe six hours. Obviously she wasn't happy there because uh, she was absconding from the establishment, as did some of her contemporaries as well and what would tend to happen would be that when they did that uh, they would come down to Cardiff. The first time I saw Karen abscond and get into the car was this end of the building and we heard a commotion coming from the house then all of a sudden we seen her run down and she came round the corner the car was sort of parked at that angle and she just ran down and jumped straight into the back of it. And he drove off and down around. 
Could that mystery man in the car have been Alan Charlton? You could see he was a, a grown man, but you couldn't see his face. You could only see him um, at an acute angle. And then, by the time I come round, she was in the back of the car and the car had gone round the corner. According to Lee, he saw Karen get into waiting cars on several occasions, but she'd always returned. If you went missing, most of the time, the friends knew where you'd gone. You know? There was no mobile phone, but word of mouth. Eventually, somebody would crack, and they'd say to the staff, oh, he's gone here. You know, and then it's like, oh, well, back you come. For Karen, it seemed nobody did crack when she failed to reappear. The boys were capable of living their lives. But the girls looked scared. Karen included. I suppose a trouble soul, really, because um, I don't think she had anybody the same as we all did. I don't think she had anybody that she could actually talk to and tell what was going on. Nobody would report her disappearance or that she hadn't returned to the home or to school. In life as in death, Karen Price was a little Miss Nobody. But just who had been responsible for her murder? Back in late 80s Cardiff, a team of murder squad detectives had been trying to identify the remains of a young girl found buried in a shallow grave. A forensic facial reconstruction using the girl's skull had allowed investigators to give Little Miss Nobody a face. And a UK-wide press and TV campaign resulted in officers putting a name to the face, Karen Price. Now, another new forensic technique pioneered by pathologist Peter Venezes helped confirm the skull definitely was Karen's. Well, what stands out about this particular case for, um, for me was that uh, it, was, it was actually probably the first case that I did where um, we, had, we were involved in a murder inquiry with facial superimposition. Certainly one of the first in this country, as far as I'm aware. Using a photograph police now had of Karen, Dr. Venezes was able to compare that to her skull found in the shallow grave. Basically, what we did was we, we took an image of the skull, which was, then, which was then recorded. That was used as our first image. Uh, we could then, because we had the skull there, we could turn it around into different positions. So we could match it up with the, with the angle at which the photograph we had. So we took into account the perspective. And by doing that at the different angles, we could then see whether different parts of the anatomy of the skull matched up with different parts of the anatomy of the photograph. And also, because she was smiling, we were able to see the outline of the teeth, um, both in the photograph and in the skull itself. So that was very useful. And actually, not just in her case, but it was a very useful technique that we used in a number of other murder cases that, that we did over that time. And the now tried and tested forensic technique of DNA sampling, still in its early days back then, would provide the ultimate proof the bones belonged to Karen. They really had to do this because the facial reconstruction and superimposition were all, it was all very well, but you needed something which was completely definitive. This is when they went to Sir Alec Jeffries and they, he advised them to go to the families and get samples. In the early 1980s, geneticist Sir Alec Jeffries had developed the revolutionary technique of genetic fingerprinting and DNA profiling. Two years before Karen's remains were discovered, Jeffrey's technique had led to the world's first murder conviction using DNA. Colin Pitchfork, whose semen had been found at the scene of the rapes and murders of both Linda Mann and Dawn Ashworth, received a 28-year prison sentence. 
Now, similar science, taking DNA from Karen's estranged parents, could prove a familial link to the bones found in the garden. They, um, they then were able to get the samples, and that's when they were able to match these with the samples that were taken from the bones at that time, and it was successful. I believe Sir Alec Jeffries in court said that, the, um, uh, that there was a 99.9% .9 chance that it was Karen Price. Forensics had identified the victim. Now detectives in Cardiff needed hard evidence against the man they suspected of Karen Price's murder. And they were about to receive a call that would break the case wide open. I was watching TV with my friend Idris, his partner and my partner. Crime Watch came on and they were talking about a young girl, Karen Price, who had gone missing in Cardiff and her body was found. Um, Idris had said that he knew her and he knew her boyfriend and somebody she was hanging around with. Idris Ali had been 16 at the time of Karen's murder. Eight years on, he had a girlfriend and a son and was sharing a house with Make Corcoran in Cardiff. Nick Ross concluded the programme by saying, if you were a friend of her then, be a friend of hers now. And I repeated those words to Idris. If you were a friend of her then, be a friend of her now. The police are looking for any information. If you know the boyfriend, that might give them a clue as to what might be going on. Officers were dispatched immediately to speak to Idris Ali. And then he was interviewed over a, a number of days. Uh, and he eventually told us that he had actually supplied young girls to Alan Charlton to attend at some of the parties that he used to have at his basement flat. At one of these parties, two girls had been invited. He'd actually supplied them. One of those girls was Karen, and the other, only 13 at the time, would provide detectives with the vital evidence they needed against Alan Charlton. She was able to tell us that there was a party, that she was there with Karen, Alan Charlton had asked both girls to undress so that he could take photographs of them on the bed. Karen refused, and as a result of her refusal, Alan Charlton struck her. She told us that as a result of that first blow by Alan Charlton, Karen Price was nearly certainly unconscious, possibly even dead already that Alan Charlton tied her hands behind her back, uh, put her on the bed uh, and continued to assault her, despite the efforts of both her and Idris Ali in preventing him from doing so. The key witness would also confirm the forensic analysis about what happened to Karen in the days after she'd been murdered. Idris Ali was able to tell us that the body wasn't buried immediately that it had been kept in the basement flat for several days whilst Alan Charlton was deciding what to do with it. But he was then made by Charlton to return to the flat to assist him in disposing of the body in the grave in, in the rear garden. After almost a decade, the tragic story of a girl society had chosen to forget was finally being told thanks in no small part to forensic science. I think it's fair to say that this was a hugely significant investigation for anybody who, who worked on it. Uh, the teamwork was outstanding, not just from within the police officers themselves and the other members of staff that were involved, but also the, uh, the fr forensic science teams that, that were involved and so worked closely together. Uh, with the investigation team itself. Looking back on it, I suppose one feels, uh, I suppose one feels, or I feel, a sense of uh, doing a job
properly and getting the right results um, and knowing I've got the right results that is always a, 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 a good thing to do in 1991, Charlton would appear in court, charged with Karen's murder, eight years earlier. Yeah, I made a point the whole time I was there, keeping an eye on Charlton, just totally impassive, almost as if he wasn't even listening, I don't know. Just, you know, you, sometimes you get people in, in the dark who are writing copious notes, who are constantly wanting to talk to their legal team. You just sat there the whole time, never said anything to anybody. Very strange individual. What we know about Alan Charlton and the perception that other people had of him is very largely determined by what happened in this case. So we know, for example, that um, Idris Ali, who was his co-accused, was terrified of him uh, and that he wouldn't want to cross him and that he was, in fact, um, induced to participate in the killing by him because of his fear of him. So he must have had a very powerful, controlling personality. That's absolutely clear. A jury would find Charlton guilty of Karen's murder and sentence him to life with a minimum of 15 years in prison. Now, this was in 1991, and the 15 years clearly was up in 2006, but to this day, he remains in prison. Very often it's the case that if defendants uh, refuse to accept their guilt, they will not be released. You know, if he comes out, heaven help somebody. Because he is a dangerous, dangerous man. I hope he never gets out. Ali was also convicted of murder, but his conviction changed to manslaughter at a retrial in 1994. I think it was a real achievement to successfully not only convict the people responsible for her death but to even identify her in the first place given what we started with which was literally a bag of bones the police investigation might have delivered justice for karen but the question remained how had a vulnerable young girl been allowed to simply vanish without the alarm being raised one of the huge sadnesses about this case is that one could say that people were more um, caring about Karen after her death than they had been during her life. If she had been cared for in the way that she deserved, as everybody deserves, as every vulnerable person deserves, then she wouldn't have ended up in the appalling situation that led to her losing her life. I mean... Me, personally, I find that too difficult to comprehend. Really too difficult to comprehend, because everybody I knew at that time, every child I knew growing up, always, and somebody to watch it back, always. And I just feel really sad that Karen didn't. It's horrible, really horrible, to know that <laughs> you can die and not be bothered about. Whenever there's a murder, it's the job of detectives to find out who the killer is and how they killed. And often, it's forensic evidence which provides the clues. Each bit of information delivers that to the whole jigsaw. I was able to test that sample 
uh, and they got a DNA profile. There's no doubt at all that forensics were absolutely crucial in this case. In this series, we shine a light on how cutting-edge forensic techniques and the power of science were able to bring some of our most dangerous and despicable killers to justice. This was such an unnatural crime. It's not a question of if he will kill again, it's a question of when. He believed that he was invincible and, and that nothing could stop him. We'll hear how some of the toughest and most disturbing crimes were solved thanks to the tiniest fragments of evidence. When you begin a forensic investigation, you don't know what you're going to find. The officer plunged his hand into loose soil and actually felt cold flesh. From the type of insects that were around, uh, she'd been dead for at least five years. And how even the most forensically aware of killers couldn't beat the experts and hide their crimes. You know, if he comes out, heaven help somebody. Because he is a dangerous, dangerous man. In this episode, a brutal massacre following a family wedding leaves three dead and communities living in fear. It was scary to think that he was going to come back to this area. Who knows what he could have done. A sadistic killer who taunted the police and vowed he would never be caught. He started writing, telling us that the police were no more than boy scouts. Uh, they couldn't catch him. He was a master of disguise and the vital forensic evidence that would tie the triple murderer to the scene of the crime. We also found uh, cheese in the fridge that had bite marks in it, um, and have it examined by a forensic odontologist. This is Forensics, Catching the Killer. Wakefield with the regional crime squad when I got the call from the head of CID to attend at the door where there'd been a murder. There was obviously going to be a need for a major incident room to be set up and an investigation to be run from that location. And so I came straight to here. The house itself is just on the left of here, behind a lot of this foliage. And it looks nothing like it did on the day that I attended uh, when we were called to the incident. You never know what you're coming to, so I was always thinking what are the logistics of investigating this crime and how are we going to deal with it from this particular location. In 1983, Detective Chief Inspector Mick Burdis was one of South Yorkshire's most experienced detectives. But when he arrived at the scene in Daw, an affluent suburb on the outskirts of Sheffield, he was greeted with a scene that he had never witnessed before. When I arrived, there would probably be a sergeant and a, and a couple of officers and then, uh, gradually, scenes of crime officers arrived, and, and, uh, and, and then others came. They would have found a horrendous scene, really, because there were the bodies of three people. On the staircase itself, there was the body of Basil, who had been um, uh, attacked on the stairs. His wife, Avril, was in the downstairs bedroom, and Richard, the son, he was in one of the bedrooms upstairs and, and called for the officers from the Forensic Science Service and from our own crime scene officers uh, to attend and deal with sealing the scene to prevent it from being contaminated by a, uh, too many feet and too many bodies inside. Um, and and we were effectively were preserving evidence. One of the things you do when you arrive at a crime scene of this nature is to imagine the, the, the route that might have been taken. 
what implements have been used, what, what else has happened in that scene itself. So you try to build a case in your mind of, of what, what actually took place. These were extensive premises because almost every room in the house had been part used by the person responsible for the murder. You can't trample all over the place because you'll damage uh, and, and destroy valuable forensic evidence. Just hours after a family wedding at the house, three victims had been viciously stabbed to death while a fourth had been subjected to a sustained sexual assault, but had been spared by the killer. For Mick Burdis and his team of officers, the first task was to discover who the victims were and understand more about them. Uh, Basil Leitner was the senior partner in his own law firm in, in Sheffield. Uh, he was a solicitor and a very well-respected member of the public. His wife, Avril, was a psychologist who worked with Sheffield Council, a child psychologist, and again had many, many clients in the, in the Sheffield area and, and very highly regarded. Um, and Richard, uh, the, the son who was murdered, was a barrister who worked in London and out of London chambers. And so they were all a, a very highly respected family and a, a well-liked family. There'd been a wedding here of the daughter of the Leitner family and there'd been 200 guests entertained in a, a marquee uh, that had been erected in the back garden um, and in the evening itself the, the guests dispersed to the various places and uh, it was, well, a happy time that was being celebrated by a family. What has happened to turn this joyous evening in a leafy city suburb into a bloodbath? A specialist forensic teams searched the scene for vital clues. News of the murders began to spread. Back then, I was a reporter at the Yorkshire Post, based up in Leeds. And I remember on that day, just a as routine a day as newsrooms ever are, you know, you get the call and there's something happening in Sheffield, we're not entirely sure what it is just yet, but um, be ready. Then you find out that there's certainly something major happening in Sheffield, in the car, drive down so that you're on the, uh, on the site. And I came down here with a colleague. With other journalists arriving from across the country, Alan set to work on the story. They were a prosperous, comfortably off family living in this really very pleasant house in, in a very pleasant part of the city. They must have had a, a pretty enjoyable lifestyle up until that day. And then, bang, suddenly everything changes. By the morning, Yorkshire would be waking up to news of a multiple murder. News that would stir horrific memories of another notorious killer. The effect it had on South Yorkshire was remarkable because you've got to remember again that we, we, we were less than two years after the arrest of Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, who of course was caught here in Sheffield. It seemed to bring a lot of memories flooding back and overnight um, women were being protected by menfolk who would insist on picking them up, dropping them off, escorting them to here, uh, taking them there. So there was this... Uh, almost overnight changing behaviour uh, across the city. You know, you could, you could tell it was happening. Uh, and that was a direct result of all these memories, recent memories, being reawakened. Alan was covering one of the biggest stories of his career, while Mick and his team knew a vicious killer was still at large. The race was on to find evidence that could reveal who they were looking for and where they might be. Sheffield, South Yorkshire, the Steel City, a place that back in the 1980s kept police officers on their toes. It was a busy industrial city. 
I knew Sheffield because my grandparents lived there. Uh, my mother came from Sheffield. The crimes were mainly what every other city uh, would experience, burglary, assaults, um, Saturday nights and Friday nights were busy nights. But generally it was the type of crime that you were expecting any conurbation. By 1983, Sheffield was gripped by rising unemployment as its once mighty steel industry declined. But there remained pockets of affluence, untouched by the city's economic woes. One such place was the upper middle class suburb of Dor. Only six miles from the city centre, its village atmosphere and location on the fringe of the Peak District National Park attracted wealthy professionals. You know, Dor's this leafy, pleasant little suburb. It's not the sort of place that news happened. But it was here, on Dor Road, that the peace of suburban life was shattered with news of the triple murder of the Leitner family, just hours after a family wedding at their home. Now detectives had the task of finding out who had been in the house and whether any of them had information that could help catch a killer. At, at the wedding, there were 200 guests and there would be many other people involved in the catering and the preparation for the wedding. While detectives sought statements from guests, crime scene examiners scoured the property for forensic clues. For most police forces in the early 80s, DNA analysis was more science fiction than forensic tool. So the CSI team first relied on an old-fashioned technique, fingerprints. On the worktop in the kitchen was a, a, a bottle of champagne and we were able to see that there was a fingerprints on that bottle uh, and we needed to identify them. They could easily have been part of the family, but at the same time, they could have been the fingerprints of the killer. That fingerprint was a vital first clue, but without a digitised national database, it could take days, if not weeks, to match the print to known offenders. However, the CSI team had discovered another forensic clue to accompany the print. But we also found uh, cheese in the fridge, and that cheese had had bite marks in it. And we were able to take that, that cheese and have it examined by a forensic odontologist. And even in 1983, Detectives knew that the indents left in the cheese could reveal who it was. Simon Crewe is an expert in forensic odontology. From an analysing the marks in the, uh, the bitten food, the odontologist should be able to compose an idea of what sort of teeth arrangements may have made them. So they will identify marks that must have been made by adult teeth, in fact, with the cheese uh, being such a better recording material than the skin that we're used to, you have got a wonderful three-dimensional um, mark uh, of the passage of the teeth through the cheese. So there's much more information in a bitten piece of cheese than there is in a bruise on skin. Experts were quickly able to obtain a clear impression of the teeth. This, along with the fingerprint, could put a potential suspect at the scene of the murders. But this forensic evidence wouldn't be of any use until the police had a suspect in custody. There is no central database of teeth and there's no magical way of looking anything up. It has to be good old-fashioned detective work. But the police will come up with somebody that they suspect must have made this mark. And then a comparison can be made between the teeth of the suspect and the marks in the food. So police had two important clues. But there was one more discovery in an upstairs bedroom. When we searched the house, in the bed itself, we were able to find what appeared to be an imprint of blood. Um, and it appeared to have come through a bandage because you could see the mesh 
uh, in the way that the, the, the blood was, was, was imprinted into the sheets on the bed. In 1983, blood couldn't be simply tested for DNA, but the blood grouping could be determined. Forensic analysis of the bloody sheets would reveal a relatively rare combination of blood groups that only one in 50,000 in the UK shared. All this information was fed into the murder incident room. And within 24 hours of being live, detectives hunting the killer received crucial intelligence. I received a telephone call from a, a, a friend who had been one of my detectives in Doncaster years earlier, who was then the detective inspector at Selby Police Station. And he told me that a man that they had charged with, with the rape of a lady and that it was very likely the type of crime that he would be involved in. The man's name was Arthur Hutchinson. He'd been on the run for three and a half weeks and he was rapidly becoming the prime suspect. But who was he? Hutchinson had grown up on the tough Alton Manor estate in Hartlepool. As a young man, he already had a bad reputation. But that reputation wasn't confined to the northeast. 78 miles away, in the quaint North Yorkshire town of Skipton, his nephew Dino also knew of his uncle's background. When I was younger, my me, me dad made me aware that uh, he did have this uh, half-brother, Arthur, and he was sort of a bit of a black sheep of the family. He was involved in petty crime, a uh, bit of a local hard man. As is often the case with families, rumours swirled about the outcast member. There's a story that my uncle Arthur uh, had a bit of a disagreement with one of his elder sisters, and I think he stabbed her in the, the hand. Uh, whether that sort of tells you anything about the, the future Arthur or whether it's just sibling rivalry at its worst, I, I'm not really sure. Arthur soon appeared in Skipton, looking for a fresh start. But a row between the brothers over unpaid rent would escalate into violence. I think they went down and there was sort of some major altercation and uh, my father demanded that he leave the house and evicted him. But anyway, Arthur bore a bit of a grudge about this. Dino's dad evicted Arthur from the property, but Arthur reacted in the most terrifying way possible by trying to kill him as he travelled home from work on his motorcycle. My father worked night shift at a local engineering company. He used to travel five or six miles on his motorbike. Yeah, so this is the bridge where uh, Arthur was waiting the, that evening to uh, take a pot shot at my dad. You've got a good line of vision here. He obviously pre-planned it. You could probably see about 700 metres there, so he would have only been going at 20, 25 miles an hour, so he'd have had time to sort of take aim, wait for him to get closer took a shot, luckily it missed. I think my father came off his bike. Case of attempted murder, which he was imprisoned for. Found guilty, he served five years, but by September 1983, Arthur Hutchinson was back in the community. A free man with a plan. He'd read an article in the national news about a woman in Selby who had come into some money and he decided to pay her a visit. He had this ability to believe that he would be overbearingly attractive to these, these ladies and that every lady that he met would want to, to sleep with him uh, and, and be with him. Uh, and he was convinced that, that, that he would be able to persuade this woman to, to, to marry him and, and, and set up life together. But Hutchinson wasn't a hopeless romantic. Before executing his plan, he stopped outside the house, lurked in the distance, and watched. When he was watching the house, he saw that this lady had a, a boyfriend. 
And so he decided that he would dig two graves in a field near to the house. Hutchinson's murderous plan never came to fruition. The boyfriend left, but Hutchinson broke into the house and raped the woman. Incredibly, the next morning, she talked her way out of Hutchinson's clutches and raised the alarm. Once again, he was facing a lengthy prison sentence. However, this cunning criminal was determined to avoid another spell inside at any cost. Now, the courtroom at Selby was immediately above the police station and it was being decorated. And on the day that he was due to appear in court, he was going to be moved from the cell area to an office in the building which was going to be used as a temporary court. But unfortunately, he managed to find the staircase that led from the cell area at the police station up into the dock of the court. And when he climbed up these stairs, he, he, he found that there were decorators and, and scaffolding. And he was able to uh, escape from the dock um, and crashed through uh, a, a, a big window uh, and landed on some barbed wire uh, and then over on into a field at the side of a railway line. It was the classic escape bit, you know, I want to go to the toilet. And they put him in the, the toilet and he escapes through the back window. You know, you, you couldn't have made that up, really. Hutchinson, injured from the fall from the courtroom window, had escaped and was on the loose. His leg was lacerated, his trousers ripped. But Sheffield was more than 60 miles from Selby. Could it really be him who had made his way to Dool Road and killed the Leitners? And if so, why? In 1983, police in South Yorkshire were investigating the brutal and apparently random murder of the Leitner family. The three victims had been stabbed to death in their own home after celebrating a family wedding, while a fourth had been left clinging to life. Detectives had found numerous clues at the scene, including a fingerprint on a champagne bottle. Sent away for expert analysis, they'd got a match. A known offender, Arthur Hutchinson. But it wasn't just the fingerprints that pointed to Arthur. The surviving victim, in the care of a hospital, spoke to police. And despite the harrowing experience, was able to tell detectives what she knew. She had such a traumatic experience of being handcuffed, the, the physical and the, the, the sexual assault on her, and she'd been handcuffed overnight and she'd had to climb over her, her father's body to get down the stairs. So we had to be very, very conscious of, of the difficulty that, that she was having mentally as well as, as, as physically. Uh, and we assigned one of our uh, female detectives uh, to work with her and to be very close to her. And this was long before the days of family liaison officers, uh, but it was the obvious thing to do. Remarkably, she was able to provide a sketch artist with a detailed description of her attacker. That was almost as lifelike as a photograph, probably better even than a photograph, because it, it had detail in it uh, that was really, really lifelike. It was an amazing picture. Um, and we were very, very successful and very, very fortunate to have that sort of picture uh, to, as part of our investigation process. That picture was released and they named him as the prime suspect, indeed the only suspect, uh, with the usual warning not to approach him. But if you see him, or if you know anything, call us. Call it in. Don't approach him. It was the community in Yorkshire that Mick wanted to speak to most of all. Arthur Hutchinson was on the run, and chances are he was still in the county. 
Good to see you again after all this time. Yes. Yeah. And he turned to then Yorkshire Post journalist Alan for help. It was a strange inquiry. It was different to, to any of the other inquiries I'd ever done. Well, there was that urgency, wasn't there? And the fact that you named him early on, you were so confident that you'd got the right man. Well, we knew we'd got the right man because of the uh, incident that had happened in Selby and the escape from the, from the Selby courtroom. So we knew we were, we were on to the right man. You know, he's out there, he's on the loose. That's right. Nobody's any idea what he might do no, now. No, quite. Of course, when we published his name, um, that, that really brought us major, major problems because we got such a huge response, um, hundreds of calls and hundreds of, of letters and, that, that we got into the incident room telling us that they'd actually seen him or thought they'd seen him. Um, I mean, many of them were... were Genuine, but wrong. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, some were not necessarily genuine and, and, and caused a bit of a problem, but, but in the main, it was, uh, it was quite remarkable the number of calls we got. Yeah. I think the, the other big standout for the, from this one was just the, the sheer you know, um, evilness of it. Phone calls did start coming in to mix incident room. People who thought they'd seen Arthur Hutchinson all across the north of England. I think we were all, you know, police, journalists, everybody involved, really. We were all sort of on tenterhooks, you know, waiting, waiting, uh, half expecting there to be a call to say, you know, they found a body, they found two bodies, there's been an incident in X town or, you know, Y place. I think one of the big police concerns while he was on the run about what his state of mind was and what he might do out of a sense of desperation. Arthur Hutchinson had vanished and his days on the run turned into weeks and time was making him more confident, even goading the officers chasing him in a letter to the Yorkshire Post. He started writing, telling us that the police were no more than Boy Scouts uh, they couldn't catch him. He was a master of disguise. That was another phrase he used. Uh, and he'd walked past the police several times, disguised, and they never spotted him, and they were never going to catch him. You know, it was all this taunting, I'm the master, uh, I'm invincible uh, sort of stuff. And he also created this identity for himself of the fox. For us, this was great. Because, you know, as a journalist, normally you sit at the end of the police table a bit like the family dog waiting to be tossed a few scraps of information, you know, to keep you going for tomorrow morning's paper. And, you know, we were on tent hooks now. We were waiting for the postman to arrive every morning because we were wondering, would there be another letter from Arthur Hutchinson? In fact, the letters from Arthur Hutchinson to the Yorkshire Post made this a unique investigation. And from a journalist's point of view, that was just great because, you know, we got to open the letters before you'd even seen them. That's so right. by the time you got your hands on them, we knew what was in them. Yes. And that's not the way it normally works. Normally, we have a system where the police tell us what you want us to know. But th this time, you know, we, we got full access. It was great. You're I right. I seem to remember we, we, we sent a motorcycle runner up to, uh, right. to collect the, 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 the letters. Yeah. It was, yeah. Uh, it was quite a unique... Um, experience really to see these letters and to understand them and, and, and of course because he was on the run we, we were and didn't, we didn't know where he was Those letters gave little away to the detectives in the incident room They analysed the postmarks attempted to learn where they'd been sent from but it didn't lead them to his hideout Detectives knew that Hutchinson may stop at nothing and as the manhunt dragged on, fear was growing. My dad was aware that he'd tried to kill him once and the police were aware of this, so they sent two policemen round to our house. And for several weeks while Arthur was on the run, we had two policemen sitting down watching TV with us and sharing dinners. But it was quite shocking that it was me, my half uncle, that was responsible for this terrible crime. While police in Skipton were on high alert, soon reports emerged of Hutchinson being seen in various towns and cities. He was actually covering a lot of ground, and, you know, and we know that uh, he was in Barnsley, he was in 
two or three places in North Nottinghamshire, in guest houses and the like, uh, in Manchester, uh, in York, and in Scarborough. So, you know, he was crisscrossing almost the whole of the north of England. He was certainly stealing food. He was certainly moving around. His own account is that he slept during the day and moved at night, just trying to stay one step ahead of the police. And, of course, the police were becoming increasingly anxious to get him back under lock and key. He, he boasted about um, being able to live off the land and eat dandelions, but he could eat uh, plenty of other things besides dandelions, and uh, I'm sure that he got good rich pickings from some of these places. Uh, after all, he was on the run for quite a long time, and um, he was uh, able to, to avoid arrest, um, even to communicate with newspapers uh, about what he was doing. But it would be his arrogant letters to the newspapers which would lead to his downfall. If Hutchinson was writing letters, he must know they're being printed, and that must mean he was reading the newspaper. If the police could get a story printed that could lure Arthur in a certain direction, it could help them catch him. We had connections with his family uh, and we were able to discuss these issues with his mother uh, and, and his, his family. His mother was not a well person and was due to have some hospital treatment uh, for a heart condition and she um, was in, uh, agreeable that we should uh, arrest Hutchinson as quickly as we could. Detectives suspected that a story about Hutchinson's ailing mother would have the desired effect of flushing the fugitive out. They knew that when he latched onto this story, he would begin to make his way home. He had a strong bond with his mother. Perhaps because she was the one who had always stood by him. Most of the rest of his family by this stage had completely disowned him. You know, they, they wanted no more of Arthur Hutchinson. We didn't realise at the time quite how good, how brilliant the police operation was. So he began making his way back to Hartlepool, where she was living. Uh, and slowly but surely, the net tightened. While detectives set their trap for residents living on the Alton Manor estate, the prospect of Arthur Hutchinson returning to his native northeast was something that filled many with dread. Tracy Mitchell was a teenager in the 80s, and had regularly come into contact with Hutchinson. Me and my mum would walk down this way and go through this alleyway, go in the shop and then we'd come out and Arthur Hutchinson always seemed to be lurking about and always used to come over talking. And he used to make me feel really uncomfortable, I didn't like him. He'd be smiling, but his eyes weren't, I just didn't like his eyes. It might sound strange, but that's just how I felt. Like he made me uncomfortable. According to Tracy, Hutchinson once threatened and then chased her and her friends. A terrifying experience for the then 13-year-old girl. The, the older you get, um, the more you think what could have happened if you'd caught us at the time. It was scary then, but more so, I think, now, because you understand more what he, what he could have done to you because he's obviously capable of it. With every day, Hutchinson remained at large tension on the estate grew. There was a sense of fear when he was on the run that he would come back because a lot of people thought he would come back to see his mum because he was very close to his mum, I think. And who knows what he could have done. With communities across northern England gripped by fear, Police officers from across the north were also making their way to Hartlepool, where they were sure Hutchinson would soon arrive. But would he fall for the bait, or did he have one final flourish up his sleeve? In November 1983, 
police from South Yorkshire were closing in on the man suspected of murdering three members of the same family in a brutal attack. Arthur Hutchinson had labelled himself the Fox after going to ground following the savage stabbings of the Leitner family in Dore near Sheffield. Detectives had tracked him to the Midlands, Manchester and Yorkshire. Now they were preparing to close in on the killer after concocting a plan to lure him back to his hometown of Hartlepool. We were able to set up a trap uh, to try and catch him. We knew that Hutchinson was making his way uh, into the area. But while Mick and his detectives finalised plans to ensnare the fox, a farm near Hartlepool was already picking up suspicious activity. We have a, a sensor that crosses the farm lane, that if that sensor's broken, then there's a bleeper goes off in my parents' bedroom. And this sensor started to go off at the same time every morning. Claire Bladen remembers the mystery over what was causing the alarm to sound. So it was about four o'clock in the morning, and when it had happened a few days in a row, my father set his alarm so that he was awake ready for the sensor going off and when he looked out of the window as the sensor went off he saw the silhouette of a man walking briskly so he was dressed in camouflage type clothing the the green color and because he was walking away he couldn't see his face but he was just walking briskly up our lane so of course we put two and two together and we thought ah is that connected Just a couple of days later, her farm would be the centre of a massive nationwide manhunt. So the first thing I remember is being woken up by the police at six o'clock on the morning. Um, they knocked on the front door to ask us to stay locked in the farmhouse and to ask my dad permission to search the farm. When I looked out the bedroom window, all I could see was this line of police and if you go beyond this grass field and into the cornfield beyond and you just look across the horizon, you've got from the trees on that side right across to the large tree in the middle over there and they were just literally side by side, all in uniform. Just so many of them. There must have been hundreds of police, not just across there, but down the road and then around the back of the farm as well. It's a bit like being in a film, really. Down the bottom there, you can see that large hedge. Underneath it is the brook that flows fresh water along underneath it, so it probably goes down another three feet. And then if you scan your eyes across the top, you can see the trees on the top there. That's how far it goes. Everyone was in position, so the um, police officer that was um, in charge of the whole investigation was asking if the armed police were all in position, and they said yes, they were. And then the dog handlers asked permission to release the dogs and the permission was granted and the dogs went in and you could hear all the kerfuffle and the men shouting and running and as what would go with that kind of scene. And then eventually after a few minutes he was arrested. It was amazing news when we, we learnt the, the, the fact that, that he'd been arrested um, and we were... <laughs> there was a lot of jubilation in the in the incident room at the time. Um, it is a great relief that, that you've made an arrest of somebody as dangerous as this. To think that we were floating around the farm as young ladies, to think that that could easily have happened to us, it's just not worth thinking about. It does give you goose pimples. After 39 days on the run, the prime suspect, Arthur Hutchinson, had been arrested. But that didn't mean the police work was over. Now Mick and his team needed to gather the remaining evidence that could prove he was responsible for the Leitner's murder. This was in an era before complex DNA evidence, so they relied on more primitive methods to tie Hutchinson to the scene. First was a fingerprint found on a champagne bottle, which they knew matched their suspect. 
but on its own, it wasn't enough proof. Detectives also had teeth impressions made by the killer after he'd bitten into a piece of cheese. With Hutchinson now in custody, a fresh imprint could be taken for comparison. The cast of the teeth is offered up against either the original piece of food or more likely a cast of the food. And there would be enough similarity between the edges of the teeth and the marks in the food. The value of the, the examination and the forensic examination was to find the bite marks and to look at the, the shape of the bite mark and to find the fingerprints on the, uh, the champagne bottle which were conclusive forensic evidence that uh, Hutchinson was the person responsible for this crime. And last of all, detectives had found blood on bed sheets in an upstairs bedroom, which forensic tests had identified as a blood grouping combination shared by only one in 50,000 people. When Arthur was arrested, they found a cut on his leg and tests carried out in custody confirmed he shared the same rare blood group combination found at the scene. Science could prove without doubt that Hutchinson had been in the property, and together with the evidence from the survivor, everything suggested he was responsible for the murders. There's no doubt at all that forensics were absolutely crucial in this case. Uh, the weight of forensic evidence ultimately is what trapped Hutchinson. At Durham Crown Court in September 1984, Hutchinson faced trial for triple murder and rape. It took just four hours for a jury to find him guilty on all counts. Initially sentenced to life with a minimum of 18 years, his sentence was later increased by the Home Secretary to a whole life tariff, meaning he'll die behind bars. You can put together a really strong argument that says he can never be safe among normal people. No matter how old he is, there will always be a flicker of doubt about letting him back into society. Personally, I'm more comfortable with him behind bars. As far as I'm aware, Arthur's never shown any remorse. He's never admitted to the crimes. But the fact that you can't hold your hand up and say that you've done it, you're not coming out of prison. You can't get into the mind of, of, of these people uh, because of his, his fantasies, uh, because you don't know what the next fantasy is going to be. Um, and he was such a dangerous man. He believed that he was invincible and, and that nothing could stop him. Putting Hutchinson behind bars couldn't change the fate of the Leitner family. For them, it was too late. But forensic science had ensured that Arthur Hutchinson wouldn't harm anyone else. Thanks to science, one of Britain's most dangerous killers had been stopped in his tracks. Hutchinson. 